Hey, I'm Norm from TastyPC.TV, and today I'm doing a review of the MSI Z97 Gaming 7 Motherboard. Now this is my first ever MSI review, or actually the first ever MSI product that I've looked at in person, so I'm very excited to be doing this video. I've always really loved the whole dragon design of the Gaming G series boards. Um, but in this video I'm going to take you for a look around the motherboard, see what it's like to overclock on, and then take you for a really quick look around the software and BIOS. So let's get started. As I said in the introduction, I do really love the whole dragon theme design of these boards. So as you can probably guess, I do really love how the board looks, especially this heatsink down here. And the board does come with this really nice kind of like sticker or badge. Um, I really love that even though it's sort of like a black PCB, that it's kind of like a matte black rather than like the standard black you're used to seeing on PCBs. I really like that. And then the design of this heatsink up here, I really love that too. It's supposed to be designed around a dragon claw. I think it looks more like scales and this it's kind of like a dragon claw that's kind of like folded in on itself, holding something, if you get what I mean. But you can still tell it's dragon themed. Um, and I love this little dragon like poking up the side there. It's really cute. But they're calling their VRM design Military Class 4, which I can count 12 chokes along here and 6 PWMs on the back. So it tells me it's a split 12-phase um, design, which, um, as I said in my Sabertooth review, it's not about the quantity of phases or, you know, whether they're full, whether they're split. It's purely down to, you know, the quality of the parts used and how well they're implemented. But the board's using super ferrite chokes, aluminium dark caps, which apparently have a 10 year lifespan, and high C caps, which are apparently really small, really energy efficient capacitors. So then with the socket, it's 1150, which can, um, or is compatible with Haswell, Haswell Refresh, Devil's Canyon, and Broadwell. Then with the memory, we've got four DDR3 dual channel slots, which um, can support maximum 32 gig or 3200 megahertz. And with the PCIe slots, we've got three 16x 3.0 PCIe slots, although these two are only wired at 8x. And this board's compatible with either three-way AMD Crossfire or two-way NVIDIA SLI. So you can run the boards in either 16 times, 8 times, 8 times, or 8 times, 4 times, 4 times. And the board does come with an SLI connector. You've also got four 2.01x slots. Taking a closer look around the board, we've got the 8-pin CPU power connector, two 4-pin PWM fan headers, we've got the VCheck connectors, which are multimeter voltage readout points, um, and obviously you see included VCheck cables with these, and I do really love that these are on the board, it's always so much easier and <laughs> so much better when I can use these for overclocking for reviews, so I'm really glad these are on the board. We've also got 24-pin power connector, and another 4-pin PWM fan header, and a digital debug code LED readout display. We've then got a slow mode booting switch, which is disabled at the moment, um, and you use this for extreme overclocking. And if you enable, what it will do is it will just boot into Windows more slowly, putting less strain on your CPU. So an overclock that before would previously just be too unstable to even boot into Windows, you've got a chance of booting with it. We've then also got a right angled USB 3.0 header, which I do really love this right angle because it means obviously it will look neater plugging the cable in. And then way over here, we've got a clear CMOS jumper, which obviously clears the CMOS, but there's also a clear CMOS button on the rear I.O. And then this one here is a case intrusion head up. We've then also got the BIOS battery. And then way back over here, we've got eight SATA free six gigabit ports. Um, and the board does come with four SATA cables, two of which have a right angle connector on one side. And you've also just got some stickers to kind of label your drives. Now these bottom two down here are powered by the Asmedia 1061 chip. This board doesn't actually have any SATA Express ports, and that's because the M.2 socket it uses, they um, say that you can pick up an optional kind of M.2 to SATA Express converter, so that's kind of their method. If you want to use SATA Express, that's what they want you to do. Um, so yeah, you do have an M.2 socket, which can fit either 42, 60, or 80 millimeter SOSA drives, and with this you can get speeds of 10 gigabit per second, and it kind of works the same as SATA Express in that it provides two 2.0 PCIe lanes. But then back down here, you've also got a multi bias switch, which allows you to switch between biases if you brick one. Um, so on the left of it, it's got a blue LED if you're in bias A, and on the right, it's got a green LED if you're in bias B. And you can see the two um, bias chips here. We've then also got the front panel headers, um, and you do get these little connectors just to make it easier to plug in the front IO cables. We've got two USB 2.0 ports, a serial port connector, and a trusted platform module header. We've then got the OC Genie 4 button, which basically when you press it, what it will do is it will kind of automatically overclock your PC when you boot it back on. Um, and then if you just don't want the overclock anymore, obviously turn your PC off, press the button, and it will be disabled again. 
We've then got a restart on power button. We've then got an audio power switch, which switches between using the power from the board, which is set to at the moment, or using power straight from the power supply. What you have to do for that is plug in the included um, kind of dedicated audio cable that I've got here, which is Molex on one end, into this header here. And then what it will do is its purpose is to kind of provide more stable power just to give you kind of purer audio. But we've also got the front panel audio connector. But the onboard's audio solution is called Audio Boost 2, and it uses a Realtek ALC1150 codec, which is protected by an EMI cover to isolate the chip from EMI distortion. The whole kind of onboard circuitry section is also separated off from the rest of the PCB with a red LED strip just to kind of, you know, help prevent um, interference. The audio section makes use of Nichicon Japanese capacitors, which are high quality caps specifically designed for audio. We've also got built-in dual headphone amplifiers, which help power high-end headphones. And these have got independent circuitry to help prevent crosstalk or kind of interference between the channels. And the whole Audio Boost 2 thing is also kind of powered by um, Creative Sound Blaster Cinema 2 software, which essentially kind of gives you access to the SBX Pro Studio software suite, which is a pretty cool piece of software. Um, I will take you for a look around it in the software section. And then lastly, I've also got a four pin PWM fan header up here. And then one way down here, which I completely missed when I was going around the board earlier. And in total, this motherboard's got five four pin PWM fan headers. Then with the Rario, I have to say the Rario Shield firstly, or M Shield as they're calling it. I do really love this. It's by far the best I've used in person. It looks really nice and it's really spongy, which I really love. But we've got a PS2 port, two supercharger USB ports, which obviously used to charge devices. We've got a clear CMOS button, eight USB 3.0 ports. These two are powered by the native Intel PCH, but the other six are powered by the S Media 1074 and 1042 chips. We've got two HDMI ports, a display port and optical out. We've got a killer gigabit LAN port, and this board uses a killer E2200 um, gaming network chip, which prioritises gaming network traffic automatically over kind of any other networking traffic, which is great for gaming. And then we've also got the audio jacks. Now these USB ports use USB audio power, which is obviously used use for like headphones and DACs, where it provides a constant stable 5 volts so that you don't get distorted audio like you would if you had kind of wavy or unstable power. And then the audio jacks are gold plated and rated up to 600 ohms. And then with the board you also get a couple of manuals, a CD which is in a black cover rather than a white one thankfully, because normally whenever they're in white ones it completely glares the camera out. And then you also get a door sign which on one side says I'm sorry busy gaming, on the other says I'm not here, which is great because normally on one side it says I'm sorry busy gaming, on the other side it's like come in, <laughs> look just because I'm not gaming doesn't mean I want you to just come in. <laughs> So now that I've got the board on my test bench, I'm going to really quickly take you for a look around the BIOS. So obviously this is the home page, and firstly we've got the Overclock Genie button, which does exactly the same as the Overclock Genie button on the board. If you press it, it gives you an automatic overclock. And I found that with my Force on 70k, it puts me at roughly 4 gigahertz. We've then also got an XMP button, which if you press and then restart, it will automatically set your XMP profile for you. We've also got the CPU and motherboard temps, the time and date, the BIOS version and the settings. And then along here we've got the boot device priority order, where you can just kind of drag the icons to determine the priority, left is the highest to the lowest on the right. We've then got the settings menu, where firstly we've got system status, which pretty much does what it says on the tin and gives you the status of your system. We've then got advanced settings, boot settings, security options, and then just here where you can, you know, exit, um, save changes or restore defaults. So we've then got the overclocking settings, where you can either keep it simple like it is now, or change it over to advanced settings. And wherever you are in the menus, if you go over here and click info, you've got a list of volts. So then we've got the mFlash menu where you can flash your BIOS. We've got the overclock profile where you can save and load different overclocks. We've got a hardware monitor menu, which gives you a fan curve to be able to play with. And you can also see temps and volts here. And then we've also got the board explorer menu where you can just kind of see what's installed where on the board. And then up here, if you click the heart, you've got a favourites menu um, where you can choose the BIOS's default homepage and you've also got five different kind of favourite lists. So to add something to favourites, you just highlight hover over it and hit F2. And then if you're in the favourites list, you can hit F2 again to remove something from the list or change the order. 
So I have to say, I do really love the look of this bus, and it's a really easy bus to kind of navigate around. It's very simple, but I can't help feel like the homepage is very empty, and there could have just been more to it, like with the um, Sid 97 Asus bus that I've used. For example, the fan curve on that bus, it's in the homepage, whereas this, you've got to go into the hardware kind of monitor menu to find that. And I think even if you change it so the homepage automatically loads into one of the menus or one of your favourites lists, it still doesn't have the required effect. So after having a look around the BIOS, the next step was to see what the board was like to overclock on. And I did this with my i7 470K um, at 4.6 GHz, and the goal was to see what the lowest feed core I could get it stable at was for two hours. Um, I should mention this is the same CPU I used to do the overclocking test for the two other said 97 boards that I've reviewed. Um, but I'll put the kind of results up now, so they're on screen for longer, and I'll put the test bench specs in description below for any of you who are interested. But basically the results you see is firstly what I typed into BIOS, then what BIOS registered it was running at, then what CPU said, said that the vehicle was at during stress testing, um, which I use ADA64 for, by the way, um, and then lastly what the multimeter said it was running at, also during stress testing. Um, and the reason why I give you all these values rather than just kind of showing you a CPU said screenshot is that CPU said has been pr has proven to me to be inaccurate in the past, and I also find that across different motherboard manufacturers they use different methods of kind of reading the voltage and CPUs are just kind of prefers or works better with some of those methods than others. Um, to be honest, I don't really feel like it's fair comparing across different motherboard manufacturers at all because, you know, how would you truly know that the voltage that the motherboard's BIOS or the motherboard software is telling you that it's at is actually, you know, what it's at, which is one of the reasons why I always use multimeter whenever possible in my overclocking tests. So I'm so glad that the um, Gaming 7 has multimeter readout points. Um, Unfortunately, the two Z97 boards that I've compared it to didn't have them, um, but the only board that I had which I could compare it to was the Maxima 6 formula, which is a Z87 board. But So yeah, um, okay, so stable at 4.6 GHz for two hours, I typed into the BIOS 2.99, and the BIOS registered that it was running at 1.3, sorry, 4 volts. Then CPU said, said it was at 1.312 volts, and then lastly, the multimeter said it was anywhere between 1.304 and 1.307. So, very impressive overclock. It required, it's actually the least volts that this CPU has needed to be stable for two hours at 4.6 gigahertz before, which is very impressive, especially that it beat the 6 formula, which is a significantly more expensive board. And what and from what I found from my kind of results, or, or my results so far, is that Z87 requires less volts to be stable than Z97. So I'm very impressed with how well the board overclocked. Um, Fortunately, I still couldn't get to 4.7 gigahertz. Um, I had to up the volts a lot, and then at 1.36, it blue screened after like two minutes of stress testing, and then 1.37 volts, it just throttled. So until I delid the CPU, I will continue to not know whether it can reach 4.7 gigahertz. So I'm now going to take you for an even quicker look around the software than I did with the BIOS. Um, but firstly, the Z97 Gaming 7 board does come with six month XSplit premium license, which is pretty cool. But firstly, we've got the MSI Command Center software, which allows you to adjust and monitor your system settings. So for example, your CPU's frequency, your CPU's voltage, your DRAM frequency of voltage, your inbuilt GPU's frequency of voltage. It allows you to create a RAM disk. It gives you yet another button to be able to, be able to enable the um, Overclocking Genie Auto Overclock. You've also got control of your fans with a fan curve or like a dial. And then along the bottom, you've got some more menus, which give you like pop-up um, menus where you can control your volts or like your memory timings or um, be able to monitor your temps and volts, etc. And then there's also one which will allow you to set it up so you can control the command center from a mobile device. We've then got the MSI Gaming app, which allows you to really quickly swap between three different overclocks. Um, the overclocking mode being the same overclock that you get when you hit the overclock genie button. We've then got the Sound Blaster Cinema 2 software, which gives you five different profiles which you can edit. Um, listening to music, watching a movie, playing a game, talking to someone over your PC, and then a custom one. And you can kind of edit all these with the SBX Pro Studio Suite, which is pretty cool. It gives you options, for example, like Dialogue Plus, where when you're like watching a movie, it will enhance the dialogue. So like if it's an explosion, you'll still be able to understand what people are saying. We've then got the Killer Network Manager, which is a program which allows you to control and optimise your system's network. And the main menu for this does look like Windows 8's Metro. 
But in the applications tab, you can see all the programs that use or have previously once upon a time used um, network bandwidth. And you can use the upload and download sliders to set the butter aside bandwidth for these. And then you've also got a little like, drop down to be able to set the priority from highest to low. In the system performance tab, um, you're able to monitor your download and upload network bandwidth usage and also see your top five applications by total traffic. Then in the network settings tab, it allows you to configure your upload and download speed, enable bandwidth control and test your network speed. And then the killer ethernet tab just displays your network settings. We've then got the MSI Live Update 6 software, which will scan and download the latest drivers for you. The MSI Supercharger software, which when enabled, will turn the rear to USB 2.0 ports into the supercharger ports so that devices can charge, which need 1.6 amps rather than just 0.5. We've got the MSI Smart Utilities app, which will allow you to really easily enable either Intel Rapid Start, Intel Smart Response, or Intel Smart Connect. We've got MSI Eco Power, which will allow you to toggle any of these options off down the side. So for example, the M.2 and then these two SATAs, because I'm not using these. And that just reduces power consumption and therefore you save energy. We've also got the MSI or Intel Extreme Tuning Utility, which is just gives you another way to be able to overclock. Um, it also gives you a stress test, a benchmark, and you can load profiles and pair apps to them. And then we've got MSI Fast Boot, where when you turn it on, it boots faster, but when it's slower, it gives you more time to you know, you know, spam, delete to get into the BIOS. Um, and then this button here, which if you press it, you're, you will just be taken straight to BIOS. And then lastly, I just wanted to show you the Gaming 7 motherboard while it was on. And as you can see, the MSI logo shines bright white, which I do really love. You normally only really find sexy lighting on more expensive boards than this, so I really love that this board does have lighting. Although I have to say, given that it is a bright white LED, it does mean that with certain build colour themes, it will be quite hard to work around. So for example, if you're going for like a red and black theme, which I imagine is the one you're going to be going for most likely, given that it's a red and black themed board, it can kind of you know take away from the theme um also there's you know the you've got the red led strip down here you've got a white led underneath this little audio boost bit which makes it look pink and then also you've got the q code readout which is green so the motherboard can look a little bit like a christmas tree and that can be quite hard to work around so what msi have done is in the bias you've got an option where you can turn all the leds off apart from the q code readout which is really great if you want to create like a stealthy looking rig or if you want to create a theme and don't have to work around like the white leds or the other leds it is really nice that you've got that option to have it on or off either way i personally wish they had made it a red led just to kind of you know tie in better um but either way i would if i was using this rig personally and i wasn't using red or white led fans i'd leave the led on and then make this hati logo pink to just kind of bridge between the white and the red i know that that wouldn't match any of the colors then but i think it looks nice so moving on to the conclusion firstly visually i do really love the whole dragon theme of the board as i said several times already um i do also really love the whole kind of like ferrari style dragon badge on the chipset and the black pcb um, but the board is great for overclocking on and I also think it's quite competitively priced. It's currently about £138 from Scan. Um, obviously, kind of being competitively priced, you do lose a few features. Like you've only got one gigabit LAN port rather than two and that's not Intel. Um, also, the lack of SATA Express. Being honest, I don't really ever see myself using SATA Express and if I decided I wanted to, then I could always pick up the converter. However, given the location it would be on the board and the cable coming out of it, it would probably look pretty silly and wouldn't be great for cable management. Um, also, the right angled USB 3.0 header. While I really like it's right angled, if it doesn't line up with a cable management hole in your case, you might have an issue plugging the cable in. Um, but other than like only having one gigabit LAN port and the lack of SATA Express, I can't really think of any features this board is missing that the more expensive said 97 boards on the market have to offer. Um, so I don't think it's a great board. I definitely recommend considering it if I was looking into said 97 boards. Um, and you know, I as I'd recommend it, I think it deserves my suite board. Um, but that was just my review of the MSI Z97 Gaming 7 motherboard. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos, don't forget to subscribe. And thanks for watching.